Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Wendy Court. I'm one of the associate directors of the uh, CCTSI. I'm located on the Anschutz Medical Campus. You've joined Parallel Session 1, which is on mental health and the COVID pandemic. We have two great speakers for you today that I get to introduce. So let me start out with our, our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Neil Epperson. Um, the chair of the Department of Psychiatry and also the executive director of the Helen E. and Arthur Johnson Depression Center. Uh, Neil is internationally acclaimed for her unique lifespan approach to women's reproductive and behavioral health. Her research has led to a much greater appreciation of the impact of sex hormones on both brain structure and function and the importance of reproductive status and sex in all biomedical research. And you can imagine that as the chair of psychiatry and the impact of this uh, pandemic on mental health that Neil has been immersed in this. So we're very lucky to have my friend and colleague here today uh, to discuss this issue. Neil, it's yours. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, I, I, told, I was just telling Wendy, um, uh, um, <clears throat> I'm going to do my best to end on a positive note because there are some positive uh, <coughs> sort of silver silver lining to this uh, relatively dark cloud. Mm. And I hope to um, accentuate those, but I do want to also not sugarcoat sort of where we are. Um, these are our disclo my disclosures and they are not relevant to this specific talk. Um, and this is just sort of what I'm going to go over a little bit. I want to certainly make sure that I'm fast enough that, you know, people have time to ask questions at the end. But, you know, we, you know, this is not our first time at the rodeo. We have actually had a pandemic um, in the past hundred years. And um, you can see here that the mask wearing wars um, were there back in the 1920s when, you know, people were arguing about uh, whether we should be wearing masks in order to curb the Spanish flu. Um, fast, we'll go into what was going on back then with mental health, because I think there are some lessons learned. Uh, there's also lessons that we can learn from a lot of other sort of community level violence, trauma, adversity, natural disasters that help to inform us in the mental health field as to what kind of problems we're likely to see, um, and then how long these problems are going to last and what kind of resources we need to put into place. So then we'll talk also about sort of where, where we are right now prior to the pandemic with respect to our mental health resources. Um, across the country, because I think we have to think about the mental health landscape here in the United States, even before the uh, pandemic began. And then what did we know about the, this pandemic and how people are, are functioning? And it's really important to think about when stress occurs in a community, that um, there are special populations and there are um, intersectionalities that impact how people respond to a current uh, community stressor like what we've been experiencing in this global pandemic, and then sort of what is being done. So again, to start off talking about what we learned in the Spanish flu, um, basically there wasn't a lot written about the mental health pieces of this um, until more recently. Um, and uh, this particular book was reissued and really talking about, you know, what actually happened back in the influenza of 1918. Um, and there has been some research focusing on hospitalizations in Northern Europe where they were also experiencing uh, the kind of same kind of flu that we were experiencing here. Um, again, this is not US data, but it is very consistent with what we would expect. Uh, first time hospitalized patients with mental disorders attributed to the influenza increased by seven fold over the course of six years following the pandemic. So this is exactly what we expect uh, to see um, even now is that uh, there are people that are going to be experiencing mental health issues and it is not something that you know, we are going to see short term is something that we're going to see over the long haul. And that's something we see with a lot of different community stressors. Um, again, the same kinds of uh, symptoms that people are reporting now, uh, vast uh, sleep disturbance is huge all across the globe. Uh, new onset and worsening of sleep disturbance, depression, 
feeling mentally foggy. They talked about it as mental distraction and dizziness and difficulty coping at work. So again, these are the same kinds of stories that we're hearing from people who have survived COVID um, that are actually coming into our clinics now with these particular kinds of uh, symptoms. Uh, the death rate uh, due to influenza um, regarding uh, actually death by suicide also increased um, in the 19, um, 1918 to 1920s. And then uh, they were also starting to report in Europe um, a marked risk for this central nervous system sort of neurological process among those that were recovering from the pandemic. So, um, and from the influenza. So in any case, we're, this is exactly, I mean, I would say this is what we're seeing right now as well. Um, one of the things I wanna highlight on this screen is this really this emotional toll that was happening to people who were not, they weren't actually sick and they weren't on the front lines. But even if you just think about, you know, the emotional toll, for example, just on a special population like children, in New York City alone, 31,000 children either lost one parent or both parents due to the Spanish flu. So um, again, a lot of collateral damage uh, for people who maybe didn't ever become sick, but were impacted by that. Um, and then again, the frontline providers, surviving health professionals were really, you know, experiencing a lot of symptoms of grief and frustration even years after the pandemic resolved. So basically fast forward, we shut down March, first wave in April, second wave in July, third wave November to January, and that's when all of that started. Now we're in the Delta virus. Uh, variant wave. Um, and, you know, people are having to adjust to this yet once again. And all of the uncertainties that we're experiencing also um, have a tremendous impact on our mental health. The other thing that's different between now and 1918, 1920, is that basically there were a third of the amount of people, there was like a 100 million people in, living in the United States in the 1919s and, and 1920s. And now we're at 330 million. So we have increased the population here in the United States by threefold. So that is huge to do in the course of 100 years. And that is going to have an impact on the mental health landscape and access to appropriate services. So this is the mental health landscape of Colorado. Uh, basically, we have about 15% uh, of Coloradans are reporting poor mental health. And this is up from 11% in 2017. And this was pre-pandemic. Uh, then we have about, uh, you know, in the past 18 years, the annual age adjusted rate of drug overdose death increased by 111%. And again, this is pre-pandemic numbers. Prevalence of death by suicide increased over this time period by 56%, 57%. And in 2017, 31% of high school students indicated that they were so sad or hopeless for almost two weeks in a row, again, important criteria for major depressive illness, that they stopped doing their usual activities. So the state of Colorado wasn't so good with respect to mental health even before this pandemic started. So then let's look across the country and let's think about the, the data I'm gonna show next to talk about access to care and what kind of care can people get. This was a project that was completed by the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan and they basically just looked at practicing psychiatrists, not psychologists, social workers, or anything, practicing psychiatrists. And this is what we see across the United States. Basically there's these whole swaths in gray where there is zero psychiatrist in these counties per 100,000 people. So it's just, it's less than 0.1 psychiatrist in these regions. Now, what is the APA's American Psychiatric Association? What do we actually recommend? The recommended number of psychiatrists per 100,000 people is 14. 
And so you can see that it's only, you know, some of these counties in, in uh, California, some of the Northeast areas, uh, where we actually have just eight plus psychiatrists. So it's not automatic that we've got 14 there. And if you look at Colorado, you know, we've got, you know, a pretty good amount in some places, uh, but we're really lacking in others. We have 39 counties in Colorado without a psychiatrist and 22 counties out of 63 without a licensed psychologist. Child and adolescent psychiatry, the story is even worse. You can see a lot of gray and even having blue is not good. There are very few places where we actually have probably very few where we have enough people to see uh, all the kids and, child and children and adolescents that need our care. Geriatrics, forget about it. I mean, the, the most of the most of the country is is really has a dearth of people who understand how to treat older adults with mental health issues. Um, addiction psychiatry is also quite uh, bleak. So <laughs> you've got that meant you've got that access uh, landscape being superimposed and, and impacted now, or at least hosting the landscape that now is the mental health landscape in the United States due to what we're seeing, not only what before the pandemic, but now what's happening with the pandemic. So it is very disconcerting. And this is a map showing sort of the variant across the United States. Um, there's just a lot of distress. And we have overall not, the, not enough uh, professionals to be able to meet the distress. So what is the pandemic done now? Um, this is uh, reports, the earliest reports came out of China, but uh, again, depression, anxiety, sleep disturbance, and post-traumatic stress. These are all occurring in the general population at an increased rate, but as soon as you get to the special populations of clinical providers, the rate is, is significantly greater um, among uh, healthcare providers than it is in the general population. I just want to spend a minute talking about post-traumatic stress symptoms because these are some of the symptoms that continue long after the pandemic um, has quote unquote resolved. And risk factors are unpredictability and one's daily caseload at work, having to manage patients and family expectations in these unexpected critical situations, rapid increases in critically ill patients, greater decision-making burden, high daily fatalities, constant updating of procedures. So again, a lot of unpredictability. And I would arguably say from what we know about stress physiology, any kind of unpredictability and feeling like you're not, you're not in a situation, maybe because of unpredictability, but maybe also because of resources, that you're not in a position to be able to meet the demand. And that is the kind of stress for human beings and actually all mammals that has the most negative impact on our mental health, but also on things like cardiovascular disease, immune function. Um, you know, again, this is not just about the brain. Um, and again, studies where people have been involved with some of these other pandemics, being a survivor of a previous um, infectious outbreak, obviously now being at risk of another infectious problem um, is going to raise a lot of uh, sort of triggering symptoms that you see in people with post-traumatic stress. Um, so the four of us were asked uh, by the National Academies of, in, of, Sci of Science, Engineering and Medicine uh, to actually write a, a provide data uh, regarding the impact of COVID on the careers of women in academic medicine. And this is a special population that I just wanted to highlight. And then we also um, identified some intersectionalities as we were doing this particular uh, research. And um, if you want the whole, I mean, we just had one chapter on mental health, but uh, this is actually a really good publication that is very broad. Um, and if you want to understand the impact of this on women in STEM fields, uh, I think this is a really excellent publication. But in our research, we basically looked at all of the meta-analyses and systematic reviews. And the bottom line is that there are specific people who are at greater risk of negative outcomes when it comes to uh, the mental health effects of uh, being in the pandemic. So shift workers 
are, high, are at high risk. Um, and that might be due in part to not getting appropriate sleep and having uh, real shifts and, and, you know, your ability to uh, manage your schedule, uh, nurses and females. So these are unfortunately the most at risk. Uh, there's been a lot of work talk, uh, talking about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on uh, women and ensuring gender equity. Uh, there's uh, senior investigators and more likely to be males and have established reputation, be well-funded. So, you know, again, as a senior person, you're in a, you're in a position of power that when stress comes along, you may have more resources to manage that stress. Um, and then under times of extreme stress, we have a tendency as a society to kind of revert back to our, our areas of unconscious bias in our decision making. And sometimes progressive initiatives to help support people through this um, can suffer. We, we know that women are more disadvantaged during the pandemic because they're more likely to be early in the career, less likely to be highly in highly paid subspecialties, whether in medicine, even if you're in engineering or in research, your salary is more likely to be lower. People that are in contract jobs, whether it's in medicine or other areas of the workforce, we know that people in contract jobs are more likely to have lost their job during the pandemic or to actually not be paid as well. Um, so lower salary, being a single parent. And then again, uh, we have to think about some people are in the workplace have already been discriminated against. And when these kinds of you know, stressors come about, discrimination um, also can increase. And I'm just gonna, so again, these are things that we can look at. Um, if you have the slides, you, I'm, you're welcome to, you know, not look at the NASA report, but also, um, you know, some of these um, citations here, because we do know that in healthcare for researchers and for academics, there's different aspects of the current pandemic that are stressing us and impacting our productivity, impacting our sense of being able to be successful. And again, all, all of these kinds of stressors um, can have incredible impact on our mental health and well-being. Then, you know, there's the special population of people who actually contract COVID um, and even people that had uh, mild symptoms in this study that was uh, published in JAMA a few months ago, uh, found that one in 10 healthcare workers who had mild symptoms are now having long COVID and at least one moderate to severe symptom. 26% uh, after two months were still complaining of at least one moderate to severe symptom. And 11% of these healthcare workers were complaining of, of symptoms at eight months. So not a lovely story, not a reassuring story by any stretch. And then many of you've heard about uh, Children's Colorado. Uh, talking about the state of emergency with youth mental health. And, you know, David Brombaugh's, um, you know, comment that we've, he's been in practice for 20 years of pe in pediatrics. And he, again, he's never seen anything like this. And so the moral injury that occurs when you're doing your level best to provide care, and then the patients just keep on coming and the mental health distress that they're seeing it in our children's hospital settings with youth and adolescents, particularly the issue of self-harm, um, it is just, it is really mind boggling. And, um, and, it's, and we don't have all the resources that we need. And these are data from the CDC just showing that people of all ages during the pandemic had an increase from 4.3%, oops, sorry, to 11%. And then, you know, if you look at young adults, um, this is 18 to 24, the, their, the increase in suicidal thinking um, has increased uh, substantially. I mean, it's more than twofold in both of these categories, but particularly young adults. So again, we've got people that are being hit really hard. We also know um, from some of the research we've looked at that per perceived stress of racism, you know, it provides, there's a baseline effect of stress associated with racism. And then you add on top of it, the impact of the COVID pandemic and its impact on sleep. Um, there are people who've looked at Native Americans and have found that, you know, again, if you had a lot of uh, been exposed to a lot of historical trauma and you have low social supports that they've not been managing during the COVID pandemic as well. And then of course, we've been concerned a lot by, about our LGBTQ students because many of them have left school 
but then had to go home to families and societies or places where they felt less accepted for uh, their gender or sex identities. So again, there's it's inter I want to raise the fact that not everybody experiences stress in the exact same way. So what do we do? We need to support our clinical workforces. Uh, everything that we can do in our health systems to do that is critical. Um, you know, there was a, a paper that came out uh, really kind of saying that this is going to be a crisis. We don't need a parallel pandemic um, that our clinicians' mental health and well being is so negatively impacted. And these leaders, you know, Daryl Kirsch, who was the head of the uh, a AAMC for a number of years, again, they're even saying that we should have federal funding to care for clinicians. Um, I'm not sure that that's happening. <laughs> I think we have to reconsider productivity expectations, but I think this one is really hard because, you know, as Wendy and I were in a meeting yesterday, listening to a number of people talk about their discussions with the NIH about grants and missions and, and not being able to be as productive, the story wasn't particularly sympathetic. And so I'm not sure how we're going to push um, our federal funding um, agencies. We need to also be thinking about how do we support different people and different special groups to be able to be as productive. So young you know, women in science or uh, you know, and helping them be able to publish, uh, but even any young people. I mean, I know that a lot of my male faculty who have young children at home and a wife that's also in academia have had to deal with, um, you know, splitting the childcare. So I'm not sure how we're going to fix this one, but um, what we can do is make uh, mental health more accessible and encourage people to, re uh, to seek mental health care. And what I can tell you was that when we work with uh, people here on campus, I did, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And so we're always trying to find ways to help people feel that they can seek mental health care. So we created faculty and staff mental health. But the problem is, is that uh, these are the kinds of comments we hear. If my colleagues know that I have sought mental health care, they will think less of me. Thinking mental health care could hurt my chances of promotion. I mean, that is hard to combat, but that's really what we're hearing from a lot of people who call us. So we created something called the CU Wellbeing Self-Assessment Tool. And this allows people to assess themselves on depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance use, and ADHD symptoms. And then we provide resources that people can tap into. Um, again, some of them are not anonymous, but we tried to give people enough anonymous resources so that if they felt like they were gonna be stigmatized, they at least had some place to turn. Um, I just know I don't have much more um, time here. So I wanna just mention, we have to be careful with this focus on resilience because I can tell you, this is what people think. Oh my God, if I'm having trouble dealing with this, I must not be resilient. And that is not the message that we would want people to receive about this concept of resilience. You can't, I mean, you can't say, for example, that a tree is resilient until it's been really tested. We all are being really tested by the winds and the storms and the lightning that is associated with what, you know, not only the pandemic, but a lot of the political unrest and a lot of the racism and concerns about, you know, what's going on in our country. If you're not distressed, I'm gonna think something's wrong with you. <laughs> so being distressed does not mean you're not resilient. It doesn't mean that you're not strong. It doesn't mean that something is wrong with you. This is the way we respond to all that is going on with us or in this uh, country. Um, at this point. And I just want people to be very careful about this concept of resilience. We need to advocate also for continued reimbursement for telehealth services. Um, the insurance companies are still threatening that they want to go back to the way it was before the pandemic. But I can tell you the vast majority of our patients rather be seen by telehealth. We need to let people know that there's a lot of different things online that people can do. And because I don't have a lot of, uh, say for example, I do not have a lot of black psychiatrists and psychologists. And if somebody really wants to work with somebody uh, of their same racial ethnic background, they may have to use some of these products that you can find online. 
And then we have to validate and embrace not only telehealth and e-therapy, but tech is assisted therapy, as well as using some artificial intelligence to help us understand how best to get some of the resources that we do have out across the country, because we can't do everything based on the number of psychiatrists that we have. We have to think about other levels of care as well. And the good news is, is that the American Rescue and Recovery Act is basically pouring billions of dollars into Colorado. Um, Colorado is using a lot of this money to help think about mental health and the safety net of mental health services. So we've got a state and we live in a state that really does care about mental health and Governor Polis has been doing an enormous amount of work through the Behavioral Health Task Force to support mental health. So I do feel like we're in a place that is good and we're going to have new services. The other thing that is the silver lining here is now everybody's talking about mental health. And before, you know, people, you know, again, still were felt so stigmatized. Now, I'm not saying it's eradicated stigma, but I think it's getting better and more people are going to come to care. So in any case, I'm going to stop there. I hope I haven't created, uh, shown you too negative a picture, but I just want you to understand what we're grappling with and the landscape and the things that people are trying to do to help people see that they should seek mental health care, mental health supports, even for short term. And I have to say, if I have to recognize anybody, I want to recognize my entire department of psychiatry because, I mean, people have risen to the occasion here. Our volume is up by 65% and people are working really hard. And again, they're working really hard because our tagline for our department is brain health for all for life. And we really do mean that. We work across the lifespan, thinking about these developmental issues, thinking about intersectionalities to try and meet people where they are so that they can get the mental health services they need. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Neil. That was uh, terrific. I think we um, all were bracing to understand just um, the, how wide the scope of this problem is. Mm -hmm. And um, I think based on some data that you showed uh, um, regarding the pandemic in the early 20th century, we can expect this to be um, a major issue to deal with for yeah. unfortunately many years to come.